A very warm good evening to everyone who's joined us today. I'm Dr. Kirat Sibya, consultant pulmonologist from SPS Hospital in Ludhiana, and I am delighted to be with everyone today. I'm always delighted to with, be with our CCR family. So today we have, uh, you know, everyone knows the GINA 2023 guidelines are out, and it, there's a lot of excitement about what GINA is bringing out, what they're asking us to take care of, what are the cautions, and what are the things that we believe were correct for such a long time and are actually not uh, evidence-based or not, you know, so we have new founded evidence and we are looking at what can we get out of GINA 2023, 2023 to make our patients' lives better. What are the practice changing uh, suggestions, guidelines that they have come up with, which we should inculcate in our practice to overall improve our patient's quality of life. So, uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. Dr. Murli Mohan is the moderator for today's webinar. Sir is a senior consultant in pulmonology and internal medicine at Narayan Vidalia, Bangalore. Uh, welcome, Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. And next, I would like to welcome Dr. Kumar Utsa. Dr. Kumar is director of pulmonology and uh, a very uh, keen person when it comes to intervention pulmonology, I must say. And uh, sir is the director at Samaria Clinic and Agrim Multi-Specialty Hospital, Varanasi. Welcome, Dr. Kumar Utsa. Thank you, ma'am. Next, I would like to welcome none other than our poet, who is famous for his very uh, lovely prose, which come about now and then, most coveted poet of CCI, I must say, Dr. Nitin Avyankar, sir. Most coveted poet of CCI and most famous pulmonologist from Pune. Uh, sir is a senior consultant at uh, Pune Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Nitin Avendar, sir. Thank you. I wish I could, uh, you know, actually recite a poem to welcome you. It would be very befitting, but not everyone is a poet like you are. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Archana. Dr. Archana is head of pulmonology at Raja Rajshri Hospital at Bangalore. Welcome, Dr. Archana. We are very happy to have you with us and we look forward to some very interesting case that ma'am will be presenting. Welcome, Dr. Archana. Thank you, Dr. Kira. Next, I would like to welcome from Odisha, from Victor <coughs> Medical College, Dr. Gauri Pradhan. Dr. Pradhan is assistant professor at Windsor. And we are so happy that someone from the Odisha is joining us. And I feel very happy when CCI brings about a panel which has people from all over the country. It really feels so inclusive and uh, it brings out a great sh sharing of experiences from different parts of the country, which is truly secular and national. Welcome, you, Dr. Gaurav Pradhan, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Very good evening Gauri. to all of you. Yes, Dr. Gauri? No, I just said ki a very good evening to all of the panelists and the audience as well. Very good evening to you, sir. And now, without further ado, uh, I would like to start today's webinar. And while we do that, I think I want to thank Dr. Krishna for dedicating this month's webinars very befittingly to <coughs> 2023. All the pulmonologists are looking forward to this. We really look forward to somebody who can break it down for us and who can bring us the very, very relevant part of GINA 2023. And Taking this further, I would like to thank the team behind uh, the webinars which make it possible, Dr. Chenam Chetty, sir, Dr. Ravi Dosi, and none other than Dr. Ati and Dr. Shivani. Without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Murli Mohan, sir, who is moderator for today's webinar. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Kirat. You know, we should have actually had Dr. Krishna on this panel. He runs one of the busiest asthma practices in the country. And once a year, he does on, uh, you know, a massive asthma camp 
which again I think is like a Guinness World Record uh, thing or a link certainly Limca Indian record. Uh, numbers of people who attend the camp. So we should really have had Dr. Krishna. I don't know why I didn't think of it earlier. When you started talking about him, I suddenly realized he should have been a panelist here. So, you know, what you said about, yeah, I, ho I hope he'll join us later and, you know, share some of his experiences because that's what I want to focus on today. Dr. Kirat, uh, thank you, first of all, for those wonderful introductions. And we'll give you some time to write a poem about Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. Uh, but my focus today is not going to be the GINA guidelines, the way you're, of course, going to use it as the backdrop for this. I want to remind everybody that GINA is a document, okay? It's a global document about asthma. They don't even call it a guideline. And two, even if it is a guideline, it's merely a guideline. <coughs> What we want to do today is focus on our experiences. Gina and Gold both very specifically say, look at local circumstances and tailor your treatment, keeping this as a guide, but not as something engraved in stone that you must, must follow. So we have a great panel today. I'm hoping Dr. Amita will join us later. Uh, and all of them will share their experience and how to manage uncontrolled asthma and severe asthma. And we'll be looking at a couple of cases of each. Asked to share my screen. Yeah, uh, it's going to take me some time find this, I think. Give me a second. Yeah, so when we talk about asthma, we really talk about a heterogeneous disease. Hence, it's sometimes better described as a syndrome. Presentation, though we like to lump it to disease. And one of the things you know about being practiced is we have wonderful treatments and in India really we have the widest variety of inhaler devices as well as the drugs within the inhaler more than any other country in the world and despite the availability of effective treatment asthma control is rarely achieved. We have a huge burden of respiratory disease in India. We account for the highest number of deaths and disability at last five years this was the global dis burden of disease report that we came out with in 2017. It was a global burden of disease going back to 2016. And just concentrate on asthma. We have the second highest prevalence in the world. And we have the highest number of deaths and disability adjusted life years. In prevalence, we are secondary, second only to China. And if you look at mortality, we are the highest in the world. We are among the top 10 countries. And really, we are the highest in the world. If you look at disability adjusted life years, you can see the huge difference between India and China. Some of it may be that our reporting is slightly better and more honest than China's. We don't know. But at the same time, we know that we have a huge burden of disease. And this is not unique to India. If you look at the AIR study, they said 95% of patients, this was from about 20 plus years ago, was uncontrolled and just 5% had controlled asthma. Whereas you come to India, this again, one of our, you know, uh, it, it has some of our top pulmonologists in this study. Again, from a few years ago, we learned that 60% of patients thought their asthma was well controlled. But if you look at physician assessment using the GINA guidelines at that time, 60% was partly controlled, 40% was uncontrolled, and nobody was well controlled. You know, so we are dealing with a huge burden of uncontrolled asthma in this country. So as we go on, we will define what is uncontrolled asthma, what is asthma control in asthma. We'll go on to what is difficult to control asthma or difficult to treat asthma. And finally, we will end with what is truly severe asthma. So I'll stop at this point, stop sharing my screen and invite Dr. Archana to present her case because we thought we'd like to make this as practical a uh, case discussion uh, discussion as possible, hence base it on cases. Thanks, Dr. Nitin, for that excellent suggestion. Uh, 
I request the packet team to share Dr. Archana's space. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kirat, and uh, thank you, Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. I'll just uh, go through a uh, case scenario. Uh, we had a 20-year-old uh, male student who was uh, doing bachelor's in science, who was a non-smoker, and uh, he was a childhood asthmatic. He presented to us with a uh, history of increased cough with uh, mucoid expectoration and wheezing from past two months. And uh, he had worsening of symptoms in the evening time with no night awakening. So he was diagnosed uh, as asthmatic at the age of 10 years. And uh, he had one exacerbation uh, in the past five years. It was a mild exacerbation for which he had taken ICS LABA for three months. And uh, later he is only on uh, SOS ICS LABA. He had no allergic uh, rhinosinusitis, GRD or OSA or any uh, food allergies. And uh, grandmother was an asthmatic. So for these complaints, he had uh, consulted a uh, general physician and he was started on a meter dose inhaler, formitrol and bidusonide, 200 mics, one puff twice daily. Uh, because his symptoms were not controlled with those uh, medications, so it was increased to two puffs uh, twice daily. And he was also given a short course of uh, oral corticosteroids for five days along with the SOS SABA. In spite of this, his uh, symptoms were under uh, symptoms were not controlled. So the uh, physician had asked for IgE levels, uh, which was slightly elevated, two hundred international units per ml. Next slide, please. So when he presented to us, uh, the vitals were stable. The saturation was uh, ninety-seven uh, percent uh, room air, and on auscultation, he had uh, bilateral bronchitis. So we investigated with uh, CBC, which was normal. His uh, absolute eosinophil count was uh, 200. Chest X-ray was normal. We did a spirometry, which showed uh, moderate obstruction with uh, good uh, BDR. Pheno was uh, 25 uh, PBB and uh, sputum eosinophils were about uh, 2%. So what we did was uh, we, uh, even though his inhaler technique was uh, okay, uh, we continued the meter dose inhaler 200 puffs uh, twice daily uh, and uh, we gave spacer along with that. We continued SOS uh, Saba and we added oral Montelukas 10 mg uh, orally daily. And he was also given a peak flow meter and he was advised to uh, measure and record it twice daily. Uh, in spite of uh, uh, these medications, he came back to us uh, within five days because he had worsening of symptoms and also uh, it was uh, causing night awakening. And uh, looking at the his PFR values, the first question I asked him was, did he interchange the values? Because what usually we see in asthmatics is early morning dip in PFR uh, values with a uh, diurnal variation of more than 20%. But this patient, he had evening dip in PFR values almost all the five days. So on further questioning, uh, we came to know that the student was uh, uh, doing bachelor's in science with uh, chemistry as his major subject. And in the past few months, his routine has changed. After completing his uh, college hours, he was visiting a fertilizer factory for uh, one of his thesis work where he was exposed to the irritant chemicals. So that was the cause for his uh, evening dip in PFR uh, values. So we advised him to avoid further exposure to the irritants and we continued the metadose inhaler of uh, formitrol bidusonide two puffs uh, twice daily. And also we had added small dose of corticosteroids for five days because uh, his symptoms were uh, troubling him uh, very much. And within uh, seven days, his symptoms had improved uh, greatly and uh, his PFR values were also improved. So we continued the uh, meter dose inhaler for uh, two months. And after that, uh, when his symptoms were under control and uh, FEV1 was uh, increased, we changed, we uh, decreased ICS well uh, to half of the uh, dose and which we continued for uh, two more months. And at the end of total two, four months, he was uh, completely asymptomatic. And now he's only on SOS ICS LABA. So at the end, I just want to put this one uh, slide. Whenever we come across a case of uh, difficult asthma, it's very important for us to uh, uh, see for all these uh, four important boxes. First, it's very important to diagnose the case, uh, confirm the case of uh, asthma 
because it may not be ma- asthma at all there are many conditions which can mimic uh, asthma also we have to check for the drug compliance and inhaler technique the trigger factors uh, some of them will be associated with the uh, comorbidities and also diseases can accompany asthma which can worsen asthmatic asthma symptoms so we have to rule out all these things before labeling a case of difficult asthma as a severe asthma thank you very much so thank you for that very uh, nice case i think it's important to realize as dr archana pointed out that when you have a patient who's poorly controlled you have to start looking at various different things you know when you uh, sorry i'm getting a start my video message uh, which had already started so i i think the important thing to differentiate is are we dealing with uncontrolled asthma which clearly was in this case so i'm going to start with you dr archana when you have a patient with you one of the things we are asked we are aiming for obviously is to control the asthma so how do you assess control of asthma do you use objective measures or do you go by what the patient says or do you use a mixture of these so first and foremost important it's important to confirm the diagnosis of asthma sometimes in uh, the literature uh, says about uh, 12 to 50% of the cases with severe asthma presumed to have severe asthma are not at all asthma at all so it's very important to confirm the diagnosis of asthma then comes the most important part the inhaler technique and the compliance with the drug a uh, poor compliance with the uh, inhaled corticosteroids is as high as 88% and also the adherence with the uh, inhaler yes, poor inhaler technique is about 80% so it's very important to see these two factors inhaler technique and the adherence factor and also we need to investigate uh, further what is causing the uh, asthma symptoms uh, worsening of asthma symptoms like i, I already told most of the symptoms are uh, most of the factors are modifiable risk factors which can be modified like comorbidities like gard uh, allergic sinusitis or uh, rhinitis nasal polyps these are all modifiable risk factors so we have to look for all these modifiable risk factors before escalating our asthma treatment sure dr archana thank you for that uh, but you know what i was really hoping to get was when a patient comes to you every time you know this question of is the asthma controlled or not comes up so how do you assess whether the patient's asthma is controlled or not can i ask dr uh, pradhan you know when a patient comes in do you use objective measures or do you go by just the history or do you use a combination of these dr pradhan uh, we would use a combination of these sir when first we look for the symptom control and for that uh, we have few parameters whether the patient has uh, uh night time symptoms any night time awakening is a poor uh, control then any uh, frequent use of asthma reliever medication and day time symptoms if that is more than twice a week then it is significant and then dis- activity limitation that also if is it is there then we take it as a poor symptom control and on top of that we take into account uh, frequent exacerbators so any patient who has uh, more than one serious exacerbation leading to hospitalization per year that is a frequent exacerbator or any patient having more than two uh, exacerbation per year which do not end up in hospitalization is also a frequent exacerbator so any patient who has either frequent exacerbation or poor symptom control or both can be taken as uncontrolled asthma great thank you uh and you'll notice that you know dr archana had done a lot of this she looked at the peak flow meter readings and very interestingly i think you all pointed out that you expect people to be worst in the morning and best in the afternoon and this person had exactly the opposite he was dipping in the evening whereas he was better in the morning and uh, you know we'll come back to the fact that you explored this and looked for an occupational exposure or an incidental exposure environmental exposure that was very interesting want to ask you know you'll use a peak flow meter how many people here use a peak flow meter to assess control of asthma I ask for a show of hands cuz i've stopped using it completely i i used to be passionate about its use and i've stopped using it uh, dr kirat dr utsav kumar utsav dr not Nathan, using it sir uh, not using it not using it so i think two people are using it here 
three of no, us even don't use I it. I don't use it routinely, sir. But uh, this patient mm-hmm. really, uh, we wanted to know because from the past five years, his symptoms were under control, and suddenly from past two months. it was uh, really uh, uncontrolled asthma even with a high dose of uh, ics laba it was uncontrolled even with the ocs also so we really wanted to know if anything is uh, happening with uh, uh, with the uh, exposures and also we gave him a picrometer it was you know, conclusive of that but we don't absolutely. routinely use it absolutely you know I, i i completely agree that is what we tend to use it also restricted to a few patients where we're trying to find out occupational exposures that's really when it's most useful you know you give it to them you look at their weekend readings you look at their weekday readings you look at the diurnal variation and if necessary you can bring them in to look for the effects of whatever you suspect is the precipitating factor and you know assess whether the you know that is triggering off their episodes of asthma I tend to use a lot of the asthma control test. You know, it's free. It's available on the internet. Uh, patients can do it at home. It's available in multiple languages. So, can I just ask, Doctor Kiran, do you use the asthma control test at all for your patients with asthma? Not And me. how many of the people? How many people here use it? Because I use it for across I, all I my. Been... Doctor Kumar uses it. Yeah, I use it for studies, sir. For some studies, we do. We uh, tend to use it. even you we use it for research purpose only research purpose it's actually very easy to use so i tend to use that i used to use the picrometer and i found that you know patients a don't use it properly were finding it difficult to use and they would cook up some values before they came whereas you know this is once a month before they come at least you know what has happened in the previous four weeks so i've tended to use a lot of the asthma control test the others are more difficult to get the asthma control test questionnaire the acq and so on so i tend to use a lot more of the act free five questions doesn't take more than you know 2 minutes to answer that once they've understood how to do it and it's very nicely predictive of worsening control and so on so here we have people okay. who have dr mulli can i this by ob- objective or subjective means yes dr nitin yeah i mean i mean I, i'm probably an outlier here but i do use in fact i started using i was a non enthusiast for pfr during the covid times i started using it because we were not able to do the conventional spirometry is very well and then we realized that the dramatic value that it adds is definitely in my part of the world and once they st- understand it in most of the educated patients do write charts honestly they don't fudge the data they are very very reliable and if they have missed a few days they'll keep it blank so i don't think it is as bad a test as as it turns out to be of course it cannot be used lifelong so what we typically tell them tell them is that we in india have those three seasons so you go through the three seasons so the first year is what i am aiming at and first year in young patients of course i mean there is no point in using it in a copd where is hardly going to change but in a person with a young asthmatic whose expected pfr as uh, archana's case was 510 and suppose his starting pfr is 200 i am definitely going to aim and see where is it going up to what is the maximum uh, it goes goes up to and at least for the first 3 months i will do it and then I, it might be negotiable but i am i have become very very die hard fan of uh, uh, using pfr uh, over these last 3 years particularly i just want to yeah, uh, may I come in sir Yeah, 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 please, Doctor Pradhan. Yes, yeah. I I use PFR mostly for diagnostic purposes. So when I see a patient who has symptoms very characteristic of asthma, and we do a spirometry, but the test results come out normal. So and when we are uh, trying to convince the patient to use an inhaler, they are like, "Why should I use it? My report comes out normal." Then and you are asking me to use an inhaler, which and there is a lot of taboo in the society also against the inhalers. so at that time i give them a peak flow meter to uh, check it at least uh, two times or best if you use it four times a day and you come with a peak flow meter diary for at least 15 days and then if we can objectively show them that there is a variability intraday variability diurnal variability and then we can tell them that see this is what asthma is and you need to use the inhaler so in that point the patient becomes convinced to use the inhaler so that becomes handy would like to add one point uh, murli sir yes please 
सर अबाउट ऑब्जेक्टिव असेसमेंट ऑफ सब्जेक्टिव असेसमेंट अर्चना मैडम एंड यू हैव डिस्क्राइब्ड ब्यूटीफुली बट द ऑब्जेक्टिव असेसमेंट वाई आर पी एफ टी सो अ पर्सन कैन हैव नॉर्मल नॉर्मल एफ ई वी वन और नियर नॉर्मल एफ ई वी वन इन अनकंट्रोल स्टेट अनकंट्रोल एस्मा स्टेट बट विल हैव रेस्पिरेटरी सिम्टम्स विद दैट एंड सेकेंड पॉइंट इज परसिस्टेंट ब्रॉन्कोडायलेटर रिवर्सिबिलिटी एंड दैट परसिस्टेंट ब्रॉन्कोडायलेटर रिवर्सिबिलिटी along with uh, uh, more than uh, 200 ml or one, uh, 12 percent of reverse fev1 reversibility with uh, uh, taking uh, uh, sabas in less than 4 hours or uh, labas in uh, 12 hours so that is objective part of it of uncontrolled asthma yeah absolutely so i think we need this combination of subjective and objective assessment and i think dr archana's case you know showed that fairly clearly she showed that he had significant variability in peak flow through the day showed that he had a slightly elevated uh, pheno 25 if i remember right and continued to have symptoms especially the nocturnal awakening and this had somebody who deteriorated so i think he ticks all the box boxes for uncontrolled asthma i'm going to pause at this point welcome dr amita nene amita we missed you in the beginning thank you i'm going to give her uh, a chance to introduce you uh, uh so pirat will you go ahead and introduce dr amita please i don't think anybody needs to introduce her you know she is tci is most popular uh, pulmonologist but still let's go through the formality artist welcome thank you ma'am who is the head of pulmonology at hindu at bombay hospital mumbai and belated happy birthday ma'am Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so yeah, sorry. I wish you a very, very belated happy birthday, and I hope you're going to send us slices of the cake at the end of this seminar. <laughs> webinar. Definitely promise. Yeah. Sorry for joining in late. I was having some issue joining. I'm really sorry. No problem. I I saw what was happening, but welcome. It's great to have you. Dr. Archana presented a case very briefly. A 20-year-old male, a student who turned out to be a student of chemistry. who had childhood onset asthma and a family history of atopy but had suddenly deteriorated after several years of having well controlled asthma uh, i'm not going to take you through the lung functions but it tells you that he had uh, you know moderately severe asthma his pheno was about 25 and his peak flow was going up and down but worsening during the evening and they discovered that he was in the evening for his thesis visiting a fertilizer factory where he was getting exposed to some noxious chemicals which was triggering off his asthma they bumped up his inhaled steroids put him on the inhaled steroid through a spacer gave him a short course of oral steroids following which he improved uh, so the discussion we were having was on the use how do I, how does one assess asthma control uh, so amita how do you assess asthma control Sure. So, uh, just a minute. Um, thank you for reviving the whole case for me. I just had one point to make. You know that uh, in addition to stepping up the doses which were correctly done, I think the most important thing is to stop exposure. So the thing is that if the exposure is not going to continue, then you're going to make sure that the patient never becomes all right. And in that case, the patient is not severe asthma at all. And I would kind of say that uh, we as doctors are not doing a proper job. So we have to make sure that we stop the exposure. and for some reason if we can't stop the exposure they have to wear an n95 mask if that is not enough then actually wear respirators which patients of occupational uh, you know asthma wear so i feel that part is very very important and uh, i would really stress upon that much more than talking about how to improvise for the treatment so uh, so that that is what they did they first advised yes perfect great lungs and then to get it under control put them on these medications so that that right. they, that part of it they handle perfectly also yeah so coming back to the question how do you assess asthma control yeah so basically the thing is that uh, a number of things you know uh, normally all my patients have peak flow meters and they have to actually have the morning and evening peak flow readings and they are basically spoken about the variability and they always have their sos plan but so first of all i think we all have to tell our patients that peak flow meter is mandatory and morning and evening readings are very very important and when patients come to us we want to look at the readings and we want to just make sure that the variability is not too much you know less than 20% to make sure that there's going to be no exacerbation inflammation is not increasing that is one thing 
other things we always ask them if there's any nocturnal cough if they wake up in the night coughing because it's very very important we are going to always ask them if they are feeling breathless doing certain activities which did not make them feel breathless or while doing any activity they're not feeling breathless but they are beginning to cough so you know this and the cough in between activities and inability to do what they were doing before or waking up in the middle of the night with cough or breathlessness tells you that your inflammation is increasing and the asthma is probably not under control and of course you know the mucus becoming thicker becoming very very sticky mucus plugs coming out that also indicates that inflammation is kind of increasing and uh, we always check about chest tightness if it's present or not and uh, so this tells you about whether asthma is well controlled or not and i make it a point to always give inhalers which are numbered and therefore i always tell them that with the day when you start your inhaler on the inhaler cover you have to write the date and accordingly we check if the inhaler doses have got over adequately or not that indirectly tells us about the compliance of the patient so all this always happens when we want to determine asthma control excellent uh you know some very important points have come out there uh on the inhaler one of the things i've had patients complain about is no inhaler seems to last the entire course you know so a lot of patients say you know i paid for 120 doses by by about the last 30 doses i don't seem to have control of it uh we know that there is an end of dose phenomenon every day there is we know that towards the end of an inhaler you don't seem to get as many puffs i mean as much dose per dose but how else do you determine you know that the inhaler is getting over can i ask anyone nitin can you go ahead please and tell us you know of if course, the patient I mean, is looking at the dose counter is the easiest and the simplest way we have to teach them many people just don't know that the the, the dose counter needs to be checked that's that's the so, so so one of the simplest once upon a time when there were no other methods we used to tell them to dip it in water and if it floated completely then it was say if it started dipping then there is there is something left in it of course if you shake the inhaler you generally come to know whether there is some suspension left in it or not so i think there are number of those simple tricks by which people can come to know but i think the most important thing is getting at the start date as rita told very uh, rightly that you know write down the start date and write down an expected end date and i think that is what is the crux of the matter because most of the times what we are prescribing to majority of our patients is for for that medium dose kind of a usage is two puffs twice daily of 200 plus 6 formotrol bedosonide or whatever that is two in the morning two in the night so we expect that dose uh, thing to last exactly 30 days and this, if it is lasting for 20 days there is something wrong Now, once in a while i have this trick you know if somebody is really pestering me then i tell them that every 15 days you add the new inhaler and then you start with one of this and one of that so then there is no question of tail off phenomena so in fact that tail off phenomena can be taken care of by just adding the inhaler the second inhaler a little earlier and take one from this and one from that and as you know so there'll be a little bit of a cascading effect that uh, one will be over but there'll be a one fresh uh, inhaler so i agree tail off phenomena is very rare but some people are real nuts and they'll keep 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 on you know talking about it all the time so i think that can be a simple practical answer to that and uh, in in addition i think uh, i i think i've covered mostly just just see if some i have missed any point so uh, i i think you know you'll never find that in the gina guidelines yeah. to start halfway through with a new inhaler so these this is why these webinars are so important you'll come across with you know uh experienced people giving you tips like this so that's something i need to adopt dr nitin i think that's a great suggestion what i do is i ask people to you know mark each dose they take on their uh thing especially when you're using smart therapy not everybody uses you know a fixed two and two some of them need to take additional puffs especially the ones who are uncontrolled and those are the ones you're really worried about the tail off phenomenon so i make them actually mark it and say 1 2 3 4 five and you know they know when they are reaching the end of the one uh, you know the that inhaler but i really need to adopt what you're saying because that way you're ensuring that the person does get some amount and not zero amount of the dose that you want them to get great suggestion thank you so one of the other things that uh, dr archana took us through was you know the point about difficult to control asthma 
And then at the other end, she showed us severe asthma. And in between, she showed us that there were a lot of things you need to look at. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go through that. But if you look at the definitions of uncontrolled asthma, we just said what is controlled and what is not controlled. But we also need to look at what is difficult to treat and what is uh, severe asthma. So I'm just going to again share my uh, slides to take you through what is you know, an official definition of what is difficult to control and what is severe asthma. So if you look at difficult to control asthma, you're talking about somebody who's, I have some difficulty share, doesn't matter. Uh, my slide is visible, isn't it? Yes, so I wouldn't yes, yes. To we can more. see it. Yeah. So difficult to treat asthma includes asthma that is uncontrolled. So that's basically it. It's uncontrolled, but it's not uncontrolled due to only the fact that it is severe. There are adherence issues, which Dr. Archana brought up, inappropriate or incorrect use of medicines, environmental triggers, which was a problem in her patient, or comorbidities. And she said that she looked for these comorbidities. And patients whose asthma control improves rapidly with correction of such problems are not considered to have severe asthma. I'll go on to a brief definition of what is severe asthma. And then we'll come back to, uh, you know, discussing, you know, the points that one looks at before one eliminates uh, severe asthma. So severe asthma is asthma which requires treatment with high dose inhaled corticosteroids. And we can talk a little about what is high dose inhaled steroids plus a second controller and or systemic corticosteroids to prevent it from becoming uncontrolled or which remains uncontrolled despite this therapy. So, you know, you have a person who is taking treatment and needs high doses to control his, you know, this definition has changed slightly, but I thought I'd keep it because it encompasses what we want to talk about. You're having to use high dose inhaled steroids along with the controller medication. And the minute you try to bring it down, because we're worried about very high doses of inhaled steroids, and we're certainly very worried about using systemic steroids, you're trying to withdraw it, and it immediately becomes uncontrolled. Or despite all this treatment, it remains uncontrolled. That's when you really want to call it uh, uncontrolled and uh, more than uncontrolled. This is severe. So when we're talking about uncontrolled uh, asthma, what are the things that we look at before we eliminate it and say, no, this is truly severe asthma. And I'll remind you that if you have 100 patients with poorly controlled asthma, less than 10 of them will have you know, truly difficult to treat asthma. The others are not difficult to treat. And if you take about, you know, 100 patients with difficult to treat asthma, the official statistics say it's about three people who have truly severe asthma. And that is, in my opinion, possibly even that is an overestimate. Most of our patients who are uncontrolled are actually not difficult to treat. And most of our patients who are difficult to treat, you'll find a second problem. Uh, you know, when, when we have this discussion, you all can tell me what you think are the percentages that you come across. But I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Kirat, who's been very silent after the introduction. Dr. Kirat, please come in and tell me what are the things you look at in your patients when you decide these are the checklist I must go through to find out why this patient is uncontrolled. Dr. Archana took us through it. In practical terms, what do you do? So, sir, when I get a patient, I think we need to look uh, I like to see if the patient is a young patient or an elderly patient. So there are different set of problems that we see in both the groups. One thing I noticed very interesting was that uh, I was getting a lot of college students. So I asked one of the students who was an asthmatic whether, the per whether he smoked. So he said uh, he doesn't smoke, but his girlfriend said he used to wait. So this is how times are changing. So we also have to make sure that our questions are targeted and they are covering everything. So uh, one is that. Other than that, I think the technique, the, the type of inhaler we prescribe to, a, to an elderly person and the type of inhaler when it comes to a young patient, they are also different. I don't feel uh, comfortable asking an elderly to use an MDI. I just don't think they are able to have that kind of coordination. Young people are better at it. When it comes to elderly, I do like to use DPIs, or I definitely like to use a spacer if I'm using I'm prescribing an MDI. 
but i think they are more comfortable this is my perception i, I would like to know what everyone thinks i think they are more comfortable using dps and other thing i think that uh, such patients i have had patients who have poor uh, hygiene also it's not just the inhalers spaces are i find them not very clean over time they tend to become dirty and i don't think people take as much care definitely i think we all have our share of cases which we can discuss very interesting cases i had a case who had come for optimization before ptr and despite increasing dose he was not doing better i had put him on an mbi uh, and i asked him to demonstrate the uh, you know usage of the uh, mbi in front of me he was just not something it, i you know it was baffling he actually did not remove the cap and he used it in front of me can we even think at that level we don't think things can go wrong at that level but they do so demonstration of the technique adherence in my part of the country people still believe that inhalers you know they come and say oh if we start using this to hame iski aadat pad jayegi aur hum to iske upar lag jayenge like it is some sort of drug like it is some sort of so i have to tell them that you see the dose of the drug is much lower so Uh, and also that you know when you use it it's you know targeting the organ it's not affecting the other parts of your body so taking that 2 minute or 5 minute with that patient teaching them explaining them i really think that makes a difference in adherence and i have realized over time that if i can't do it at least my physician assistant they should talk to the patient they should go out take 5 minutes when the patient comes back with the Uh, inhaler and tell them how to use it and tell them about it the five thing that the assistant is seeing me recite over and over again they have to go and do it with the patient in the words then definitely work up for abpa i was looking at dr archana's case it was so interesting but you know what i was the question coming to my mind was what was the x ray like just x ray was normal was normal yeah so childhood you know maybe was it abpa or maybe something at did we have the specific testing done he had uh, symptoms since 10 years of age i believe nam said so all those things definitely we have to work up and counseling goes a long way a lot of people who are elderly i think getting them to move is also something which is a part that i push for and i ask for physiotherapy sessions just to teach them how to get going how to be a little more mobile so i think uh, any anything you want me to answer more specifically sir no so i was looking at the comorbidities you know when you whenever you look at a person who's got poorly controlled asthma you generally look at the comorbidities you see if there are any asthma mimics any asthma masqueraders you know so those are the triple thing. and i think dr archana covered all that she said you know she looked for gerd there was no gerd she looked for obstructive sleep apnea she looked for allergic rhinitis and chronic rhinosinusitis uh she did do an ige level i think given the fact that he had a normal chest x ray a normal ige level and it deteriorated only recently which doesn't seem to suggest an abpa you know where the history would be much longer you'll get a lot more sputum and so on i think she's done a complete evaluation of that aspect of it okay and obviously the chest x ray helps to rule out some of the cardiac problems and so on so in your experience uh, dr kumar sir do you find that there are comorbidities which commonly influence asthma control and what are those specific things that you handle when a person comes to you with uncontrolled asthma allergic rhinitis certainly is one of them and i find a lot of people do not look for or treat allergic rhinitis rhinitis is definitely said the most common one to be associated uh, definitely then there are uh, uh, most important psychopathologies like depression anxiety hyperventilation is very common uh, 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 laryngeal dysfunction or uh, glottic uh, glottic dysfunction smoking nicotine dependence uh, respiratory repeated respiratory infections hormonal dis uh, disturbances obesity osa grd and uh, other atopic conditions like dermatitis adpa and bronchitis these are things i look for actively in a uh, in comorbidities in patients and copd of course how often do you find that a patient has asthma copd 
overlap or that combination of problems you know because uh, that is those that's very difficult to control sir see a uh, lot of patients uh, by the time they reach us sir uh, there was a study from uh, uh, cipla that uh, by the time a patient reaches a chest physician she is already shown to different doctors seven times at least i hope everybody is familiar with that uh, you know that statement so uh, you are the mr number 7th or 8th i guess and that kafi tel fell chuka hota hai tab tak and the patient by the time he goes to you or somebody refers the patient to you is uh, in a pretty bad state so we uh, generally matlab if the patient is good educated and has google access and uses google then he will definitely go to chest physician but 90% times of the patients we remember are generally in a uh, you know asthma copd overlap state when we receive them and those are the ones we remember we don't remember the happy cases who get treated immediately we remember the ones where i put in maximum uh, maximal effort and output we remember those faces definitely so i think we majority of our uh, population we are receiving at least i i'll go for a good 15 to 18% of my uh, patient load in that asthma copd overlap pattern absolutely i would agree uh, dr archana let's come back to you your patient you decided he was on an inhaler you put him on a spacer do you think that's useful to get better control because dr kirit was a little uh, apprehensive in prescribing for a young person she said you know do they really are they really happy using a spacer and two she made another very important point about maintenance of a spacer which is often very bad do you find that a problem and you use inhaler with spacer in your younger population so if the inhaler technique is uh, okay we usually doesn't prescribe with the spacer because carrying spacer uh, is a problematic especially in the young individuals but if the technique is not good yes we uh, insist on them using uh, the spacer and we also counsel them how to use the spacer how to clean it how to use it properly otherwise uh, if the technique is good uh, spacer is not uh, required and adding spacer if the technique is good it doesn't uh, do anything on the symptom control no improvement in the symptom control if the technique is good without spacer so it doesn't add to it yeah so usually actually what i'll do in uh, anger individuals is i prefer dpi more than mdi because it is easy to carry also and uh, because of re- reasons i prescribe dpis rather than mdi in anger individuals yeah i guess in a young population it doesn't really matter yes dr nitin go ahead please incidentally i'd like anybody to come in volunteer i think amita next first dr nitin yeah. yeah i think the 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 best thing that you can hand over to a young guy is a breath actuated inhaler because it is easy to use it's brilliant it's not that costly and can be carried anywhere and it's innocuous so i think younger people most of the asthmatics are very beautifully able to use a breath actuated inhaler and increasingly it is becoming more and more and more accurate and you know once in a while you get a bad batch but most of the times last 3 years i am extremely happy using breath actuated inhalers in fact the spacer use has gone down dramatically after uh, the advent of breath actuated inhalers in big way in my my part of my practice because i was a so mdi guy we agree with yeah, yeah. we all agree we all agree totally yeah, so uh, can i just add yeah. on please Yes please Dr Amita so yeah, first of all I let totally me say I completely agree I was going to ask that question how many people here use okay. breath actuated yes, inhalers I, I but I think it's been answered so let me come to Amita now Yeah so, so I completely agree with uh, Dr Nitin and in fact there was a very interesting study which has got published last year and they basically saw with breath actuated inhaler what was the lung deposition using you know radio labeled particles and they studied it with spacer so with uh, MDI and surprisingly breath actuated inhaler delivery was better in the lungs so basically these days whenever the patient is young it's always breath actuated inhaler because they feel it's very very smart and they feel it's very very in in happening for them to use it you know so i kind of feel that breath actuated inhaler something which i'm using left right and center you just make them breathe once you also make them breathe in front of you in your uh, device and once they can make the sound of click you just know this is working so that was one point and other thing was that um, you know dr archana dr um, uh, kumar utsa even dr tirath spoke about all the uh, comorbidities so wonderfully they covered everything i just like to add two important things you know uh, which 
people commonly don't think about and textbooks don't mention it but i think it'll be nice if you remember so hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis so basically hyperthyroidism in unknown it's a very very well known cause of uncontrolled asthma and before labeling your patient to be having severe asthma you have to do thyroid levels and you will be surprised but actually 3% of patients actually have hyperthyroidism who actually turn out to be mislabeled as severe asthma so a patient whose asthma is not coming under control please check the thyroid levels it's very very important and we always think of allergic rhinitis but sinusitis and polyposis is also equally important so we often forget to look for sinusitis and nasal polyps but these also work the same way and they are responsible for being the causes of uh, you know comorbidities for severe asthma uh, i would like to add one more point uh, yeah please go ahead dr kumar uh so uh, the dictum goes that let the patient choose the device but like i like in india i don't write you know uh, patient uh, patient doctor interaction time is so like you know uh, limited and uh, so uh, i always feel that you know you have to you know uh, uh, push the patient or nudge the patient in the right direction what do you say uh, everybody else i agree I agree absolutely yeah. agree And also, I think there's no one going to sue us that you actually made us use this inhaler. So when it comes to choosing at this level, it's fairly good if you, we can look at the patient's uh, level of understanding and choose. Always them. felt that you know the dictum does not go for India. <laughs> so so I, simply for giving, you know, like keeping uh, keep, keeping some kind of an open market and say choose between this, this, this. These are five. It five, will just confuse so your patient. Don't do it. Okay. Uh, it confuses your patient knowledge. if you don't know what what your what is good for, uh, good for your patient the patient will just you know absolutely. have second doubts about you absolutely so i think i think first choice is you always the doctors second time if he has difficulties then you offer other alternative yeah definitely I, i i agree nitin sir uh one more point uh, can i add sir yes dr pradhan go ahead please yeah in my practice many i see many young patients coming to me uh, uh, with a diagnosis of asthma uh 20 25 years old but uh, a lot good percentage of them come out to be post tubercular okay so means they will have uh, taken atd like 2 3 years back or something or maybe more recently also and they come with breathlessness and they will be taking uh, treatment as uh, asthma no spirometry would be done and they present to us and uh, so post tubercular obstructive airways is a very common uh, presentation for asthma in so, my setup So as soon as you label it, sir, you know, label because... it to a separate uh, phenotype. No, but even you know, endobronchial TB often gets misdiagnosed as asthma because the patients yeah, actually have monoclonic phase. You know, so it's a very very important DD that uh, endobronchial yeah, TB in our country, especially young girls, it could be actually not asthma but endobronchial TB. And I kind of feel that though guidelines don't really say that, but before calling anybody difficult asthma, we must get an HRT check done. because we may pick yeah, up exactly. ABP, yeah. we may so, pick okay. up endobronchial yeah. tb you know that would help we may pick up trachea uh, malacia or something like that or bronchiectasis which is adding on so it would be kind of important i had a patient ma'am i really agree with you i had a patient who had a cavity and uh, it turned out to be squamous uh, cell carcinoma it was communicating with the airway and the patient was on uh, inhalers under a chest pressure for about 3 yeah. weeks only thing is the wheeze was localized but only uh, you know inhalers and went from inhalers to nebulization this happens so yes radio imaging very important so i think it's very important to keep in mind that there are mimics and masqueraders i think that's the point everyone is making dr amita spoke about uh, thyrotoxicosis let's not also forget the goiter that can be missed for years and be treated as uncontrolled asthma and more and more of the inhalers are pushed at the patient missing the goiter especially a retrosternal goiter uh, uh, that is apart from the thyrotoxicosis that she correctly mentioned uh, the point that dr kiret mentioned and that dr amita mentioned earlier also is about the fixed monophonic wheeze never ever miss that you know so that will give you a clue you're dealing with either a uh, extrinsic compression and endobronchial tuberculosis or you're dealing with a foreign body let's not miss those uh, you know classical signs of a fixed monophonic wheeze and especially when you find a unilateral wheeze never ever miss it dr pradhan brought up an interesting point about tb and this you know uh, we've already had this discussion of endobronchial tb and i think dr kumar brought up the point that 
one of the phenotypes that we're talking about, the ETO taxonomy in the latest Gold 2023, is the COPD I, which is infection induced or infection related COPD. But I agree with you a lot. You know, my colleague, Dr. Nanganath, has always been saying this. After TB, you get not just COPD, but you also get asthma. You tend to get a worsening of asthma like symptoms. And I think everybody here is seeing COVID-19, yeah. you get, you know, a lot of asthma-like symptoms. And that goes on for, for a long time. We have had patients for more than two years, never had asthma before, no family history of A2P, now suddenly presenting with asthma. So, and that's been going on. So keep an open mind, which is what I think Dr. Nitin, object, uh, you know, mentioned earlier. Keep an open mind. If your patient is not getting well controlled, run through that checklist uh, you know, allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyposis. These are individual uh, phenotypes that one must look at. And we'll come to that. I think we've been talking for quite a long time on difficult to control asthma. Uh, let's move on to the second case. Dr. Nitin, can you present your case on uh, yes. severe asthma? Uh, and then let's have a discussion on that. Yes. I'll I'm just trying to share my screen. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. So hi, I have I here is a 58-year-old male, severe asthma of both uh, eosinophilic type as well as elevated Ig. I'll roughly give you the ball ballparks. Eosinophils have remained anywhere between say 8 to 15 or somewhere between say, 7, 7 800 to 1500 or so. And the IG in initially ele in initial elevation was anywhere between 700 to 1000. Generally never uh, went into the ABPA range. And this was since about 15 years. He was given maximum <coughs> ICS lava. And as we said, for uh, technical definition, he was on formotrol budosonide. So it was 1600 micrograms of uh, budosonide uh, equivalent. Uh, one way or the other, eventually was at that time added tito titopreum and sustained release theophylline and that Montelukas and uh, was there one way or the other for his coexistent allergy, allergic rhinitis and all that. Despite all this, he kept needing oral steroids for years before he actually came to me. And on top of that, he had unfortunately picked up, and this is very often in our setup, that they somehow pick up a dead bronchial infection which was a chronic bronchial infection, number of organisms ranging from Klebsiella to eventually to even Pseudomonas. So I think the whole range of them were isolated at different point in time. In fact, I remember one time when there was no cardio also. And because of the oral steroids, he had already become osteoporotic. So I think there, are, there was enough suffering going on here. There is enough inhaled corticosteroids which have gone. Most of the definitions will agree that this will be a severe asthma. And at the initial evaluation, we thought, and that this was the only map available to us. So he was given omalizumab between uh, 2018 and 2019 for about 18 months. And uh, this was twice a week and uh, 300 micrograms uh, was the dose that was given every every two weeks. Uh, he was, he is, or rather he was a city engineer, so he could afford it. So the affordability was not a problem because I think uh, Kumar had uh, made that point that the cost of at Mumelizumab at that point in time, it even the subsidized cost of it was around 20 to 30,000 rupees, depending on what dose I'm using for him. So if I'm using 300 every twice, uh, every two weekly, that would go to even around 40,000 rupees. So whatever concessions he got. He did good for about one and a half year. His oral steroids did come down from 18 milligrams per day to around six milligrams per day. But then, uh, of course, then came COVID. And uh, 2022 to 2022, we were sort of in touch. But at the same time, his symptoms had come down considerably. He somehow kept on needing uh, that 6 milligram dose and always felt it comfortable when he used that 6 milligrams. Mm -hmm. He made a very intelligent person, so I wouldn't trust him just to be addicted to steroids and has made n number of attempts because of these chronic bronchial infections. In fact, for about a year in between, he was on nebulized tobramycin for uh, colonized pseudomonas, which eventually we, had, mm -hmm. we got eliminated. So, this time, this particular admission post uh, this 
particular worsening after covid we started regular uh, with us again started worsening in the last 6 months and was now again needing higher doses of oral steroids by the by now he had become extremely cachectic some kind of a steroid myopathy in addition to the worsening of the osteoporosis he has taken a voluntary retirement from his city engineership and still doing very poorly once upon a time when he was actively working and going all across pune city i would i would imagine that the environmental exposure was responsible now he is sitting at home and still suffering and definitely needs something has a persistent eosinophilia ige has not gone down to normal but has come down to around 400 something of that sort now this is the time when we started discussing bendrali with him in, in fact bendrali is the drug which is mepoli has been available but i i have used bendrali in two consecutive patients and in both cases i have had a phenomenal success in his case this was started about 2 months back now practically off steroids his eosinophil counts have practically become zero uh, non recordable uh, on peripheral smear and uh, this is our plan right now that once uh, again the cost has to be considered it amounts to around 4 and 1/2 to 5 lakh rupees per year for even just seven doses totally so the first three doses is around 2 lakhs and another four doses is around 2 lakh and something more so around 4 uh, and 1/2 to 5 lakh rupees in the private scenario so fairly expensive scenario uh, game for a patient who is retired now but city engineer so hopefully he has stashed some money away so i think when we are the other he should be good uh he's done well so far this is my immediate plan i don't know whether i'm going to go two years but at least one year so that is around seven or eight doses because bendrali typically is used as 30 mg subcutaneously once in a month for the first three months and then it gets once every two months so i think we will be eventually be using around seven or eight doses a year so that sort of sums up my case and it's over to you back to you for the discussion sir great thank you uh this is a very very typical patient who you know ends up getting biologicals uh and has obviously been tried on everything else failed everything else so definitely deserves his biologicals how often do you come across this dr nitin you how many patients have you used biologicals in omalizumab around 21 patients we used but the the biggest chunk of omalizumab use was in that range because i don't know whether to call it abp or not because western maharashtra on western part of the india in fact part of the gujarat part of madhya pradesh also is included in this bit of a telangana where gets included the down south part also we see a huge amount of igs and some of them are 5000 and 8000 and i realistically can't call them true abps but the ig levels are so spectacularly high at that time we were using it like abpa because there were anecdotal reports but the success rate even with modest doses because we can't match those doses with uh, the typical ig calculator that the ig those you know the omelizumab people would have with us but they were doing extremely well particularly if they started needing steroids and started going into steroid related severe infections and this used to happen to a lot of diabetics and in these patients we tried it and tried it with great deal of success so around 21 uses of uh, Uh, omalizumab uh, uh one use of mepolizumab which was aborted and two uses of bendrali one of them actually is for a recurrent non responsive eosinophilic cystitis so completely off label but the pressure patient is doing brilliantly well and this one which is again on label but patient is doing very well of course this particular the benign so cystitis thing is of nothing to do with asthma but patient researched it and came to me and said can i use this molecule somehow and is it is it realistic for me because i have this is this these are my reports and these many years and fills in the cystitis so can it be done and we just gave in with the proper consent of off label but has patient has done brilliantly we too had a similar patient you know with completely off label use not cystitis this is a hyperuricemic syndrome who came in with confusional state apart from his lung symptoms and so on we used mepolizumab on him and again dramatic response uh, but i'm going to go to dr amita uh, bombay you know the pays the maximum number of income tax in the country you have the richest <laughs> patients that were in bombay hospital in hinduja so Amita what is your experience with the biologics 
for our patients this is like you know a cheap cheap therapy you know even the bile <laughs> <laughs> no but you know i'll tell you something uh, honestly speaking i'm very obsessive when it comes to my patients and you know when it's uh, teaching inhalers and when it is checking inhaler technique it is only me it's not my residents it's not my secretary it's not my students inhalers are done only by me you know my every patient has a peak flow chart my every patient has an sos plan you get a cold you take this you get a cough you get this you get throat irritation you get this you get yellow sputum you take this i mean there are like 12 things and they are made to repeat so i mean you all will be shocked but i have only used two omalizumabs that two i kind of felt i did not need to use it but the patient had already taken it for 3 months and then the patient got referred over here because medically stopped at one place and was continuing in bombay hospital and i have only used one mepo that patient did very very well but otherwise honestly patients are referred to me for second opinion on biologics and for every patient i have said no biologic and they have actually got better just by having sos plans by having better charting of variability by having proper inhaler technique even simple things like agarbatti people are just burning agarbattis happily and doctors are writing for them biologic they're not even thinking that agarbatti is such a big trigger then my other huge thing you know people love to have red wine and i think we all should know that red wine might be good for heart but for asthma it's a huge trigger so the thing is that there are so many patients of wine who are so called severe asthma who also have ihr and they are having a glass of red wine every day but the red wine over here is the trigger you stop red wine they become all right they kind of feel that there are a lot of triggers which we completely forget about you know and i really wonder if biologics are really required as much and when people talk about huge numbers of biologics i feel that something is being amiss i honestly feel that way i really mean it I, I no no i'm completely convinced i'm so happy to hear that i've used uh, omali in two patients mepoli in one and benzali yeah, exactly. as part of the trial in one okay and one more of course so i i basically used that because we were doing the benralizumab trial uh, the patient was getting it free i must say she's done remarkably well after years of suffering she's fine but i'd completely agree with you vast majority of patients a lot of patients who come in from the defense you know saying that can i use this i will be given this i say no you don't need to use this let's try the other stuff for 3 months and as you said you know every single patient have managed to keep off biologics small number i think we should not deny them so that's not the message i think that we want to give but i think the message we want to give is assess your patient properly and 99 times out of 100 maybe i'm exaggerating these patients will not need to go on to use anything more fancy than your standard inhalers okay. absolutely to their technique yeah. and you've taken care of their comorbidities we've got a young no, panel well also said, i'm so sorry i'm just adding on kids. i'm just adding on one yes, thing sorry, very sorry, well sorry. said yeah no 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 very very well said dr murli but i kind of feel that you know sometimes there is pressure people feel that if i give biologics then you know suddenly my practice becomes you know like high rated because i get rich patients etc it's not really like that i kind of feel that if more of your patients require biologics then something is amiss like you know we need to introspect so as dr murli said if the patient requires definitely give it but before giving it please have a proper check box and make sure that everything has been looked at and triggers are something which we need to really look upon beta blockers they the patients could be on you just have to think you know what could be the they could be on nsaids pain killers just think about this absolutely so one of the things that you know, so, uh, you know uh, for worsening asthma also uh, <laughs> you have to have a matlab backup eco uh, with the age of the patient a good age of the patient absolutely so the backup uh, cardiac evaluation is also necessary sometimes it's not just respiratory Uh, it's the cardiac component also that is uh, you know triggering uh, triggering that uh, respiratory distress in the patient so uh, totally agree with amita ma'am over that and also apart from that you know uh, the severe asthma guidelines and gina also mentioned the uh, uh, bnp or nt pro bnp evaluation along with an eco uh, to rule out uh, car- uh, cardiac component in uh, before going uh, stepping any further in the severe asthma evaluation Yeah, I think six months of absolutely religiously done, excellent practice, making sure that that box which Archana showed, every single thing has been at least ticked twice, 
in the terms of either ruling it in or ruling it out for example allergic rhinitis you will usually rule it in whereas say grd will rule it out or if necessary give a trial of that so every single thing has to be exhausted before labeling anything as severe and in fact you know if you really see you will be surprised that the kind of ige levels that i see i mean so say 6000 8000 and it really doesn't make sense and we still don't even call them abp forget about severe asthma so they are not even given oral steroids so and and they are doing brilliantly well so i think uh, the question of overusing biologics in india is non existent very frankly overusing is impossible except if it is coming from say cghs or you know some kind of sanctioning authority and you are just going to sign on it but we we, we as dog good doctors or decent doctors Uh, we will stand against that kind of practice always so i i, I definitely if you give some somebody comes to me only for a sanction i said no i am not the right doctor you go to somebody else i'm not going to sanction this absolutely i think that's that's a very important uh, uh, statement that you've made we should stand our ground but at the same time as i mentioned earlier that small number who deserve it it transforms right. their lives so it's certainly worth using as i was saying earlier you know we have a young group also here so so can uh, i say something uh, uh, just one second i'm coming yeah, to you yeah, doctor yeah okay, okay. Uh, this is not to say that dr amita is old uh, that dr nitin is old but you know they are the slightly younger generation so let's ask them dr archana we'll start with you how often have you used biologics and you know uh, murli sir they are young and we are younger <laughs> yeah i'm eternally young <laughs> <laughs> so i completely agree with uh, all the seniors uh, here uh, my so dr george disosa was always telling a proper history a complete proper history will solve half of the problem uh, with any of the patient so it uh, holds good for asthma also a patient with asthma whether it is uncontrolled asthma difficult to treat asthma or severe asthma always we should start from the basic like confirming the diagnosis first adherence problem uh inhaler technique problem all the risk factors we discussed so far trigger uh, trigger effects all the comorbidities we have to look all these things before labeling as uh, severe asthma patients recently we had one uh, lady who was around uh, 30 years and she was already on uh, three doses of she had already taken three doses of omalizumab and she pre- presented to us with an exacerbation but when we took a proper history we came to know that she was never on a maintenance dose of ics laba never in a lifetime so she was directly started on omalizumab and she thought that omalizumab wow. is a substitute for ics laba so wow. such things such things uh, we have seen so many cases like that so it's at uh, most important we counsel the patient yeah. and uh, the counseling is very very important in uh, such patients rather than knowing when to give a drug or an intervention we should know when it is contraindicated that is more important in uh, oh, my yes. experience i have used omalizumab in four patients only four patients three of them had uh, uh, adult uh, one had uh, late onset as- uh, asthma and uh, three had uh, childhood asthma and uh, childhood asthma along with one patient with allergic rhinitis another with uh, urticaria so they did very well on uh, omalizumab and since ours is a institution hospital uh, uh, medical college hospital we don't see patients for mepolizumab or uh, benralizumab as they are very costly i have not used it at all great kirit you wanted to say something i have had patients who so i wish where i could have used them as a map but they've not been able to afford it but i've seen patients who have been on like this particular case comes to my mind who's been on steroid for 20 years by the time he came to me and using inhalers and we were able to taper him off steroids uh, interestingly i know people don't find try amsinolone very effective but i was able to shift him to try amsinolone and actually stop the steroids So this is my experience. and i thought we would, i would not be able to like come um, 20 years is a lot of time but were able to stop students and adrenals were that's one of the most point. important things so, to do in yeah. six months adrenal status was not compromised Dr. Kumar Utsav is reminding us that it's 9:15 us and there are audience questions. 
But doctor, uh, you must remember that Dr. Krishna has given us extra time. He says you can carry on for two hours. I'm not proposing to carry on for two hours. It's the end of a long day for us, for the audience. But I will just take us through a very brief part of the remaining, you know, how one chooses a uh, biologic, uh, because I, I think this is, this is important. And to recognize that there are three or several different groups. I'll take you through some of the phenotypes, because when you choose treatment, you need to be aware of some of the phenotypes. I'm not going to go into the NHLBI phenotypes in great detail, but I'd like to look at a few personal uh, no, Dr. Kumar, don't don't apologize. I, I I'm so glad you reminded me of it. Uh, but you know, let's let's go through a little bit more of it, and then we can talk about you know getting off the. Uh, sorry, yeah. So when you look at asthma phenotypes, you know we look at various different things. We, First of all, have to decide whether this is a TH2 phenotype or a non-TH2 phenotype. And this determines your treatment plan. Part of what you take into account is how severe the asthma is, as indicated on the y-axis. But very, very important thing that was pointed earlier is what is the age of the onset of asthma? Is it in childhood or adulthood? Okay, so that is very important. And the third thing we look at is what is the kind of biological uh, mark that will tell us which kind of asthma this is. Okay, so the, we look at various subsets. And I think, you know, Dr. Amita pointed out the aspirin exacerbated airway disease, one of the clear markers of which is the nasal polyposis. But there are several different phenotypes also. Let's not go into this. But I like this particular way of looking at it. You know, on the <laughs> y-axis, you have the symptoms of the patient. And on the x-axis, you have the infl inflammatory component. They talk about eosinophilic inflammation, but equally you could have IgE as a marker. And in most patients, you get a discord, uh, uh, sorry, a concordant kind of disease. As the inflammation gets worse, their symptoms get worse. So you can use, you know, biological markers like the IgE or the eosinophils to decide how severe this disease is and what you can use. And as you bring down the inflammatory marker, you'll find that their symptoms also improve. And that's the easy to treat group. But you have two groups who are discordant. You have one group which has a lot of inflammation, but hardly complains of symptoms. And this is actually a very, very dangerous group because they don't want to take tr treatment because they don't have symptoms or they don't increase their anti-inflammatory when they get uh, you know, more inflammation because their symptoms don't get worse. And this is the group that will end up with a lot of airway damage, fixed airway obstruction, and can suddenly go downhill almost as if they are brittle asthmatics. The other group are the very difficult to treat because they're symptomatic all the time, but they don't have really much inflammation, you know, so very high symptoms, very little inflammation. And this falls into two groups, one who are early symptom onset, atopic, they tend to be of normal BMI, but they're very, very symptomatic and they're constantly complaining much like our uh, uh, patients with emphysema and COPD, you know, constantly feeling breathless all the time, no matter what you do. But there's another group who are the obese, non-eosinophilic form, and this is another group who's very, very difficult to treat. Okay, so if you look at these groups, you have to rely on whether they are type 1 or type 2, looking at their clinical features, which is what we more importantly look at. Then we look at their endotypes, see if they have a type 2 inflammation. Dr. Archana showed us that her patient had a high IgE, but not very high, and a slightly high sputum eosinophils. Austin, adipokine, and interleukins are all coming into play when we're in groups. But this last group is what I really like to look at when you're deciding on which biologic to use. On the y-axis or the z-axis, you have blood eosinophils or sputum eosinophils. And on sorry, the serum eosinophil to use or malizumab, because that's a specific anti-IgE. Atopic kind of person, 
it's a non-atopic asthma with a high eosinophil count, then you use the anti-IL-5 or the other anti-malizumab, but our choices would be mepolizumab or bendralizumab. We don't have the others yet. Sometimes you'll have patients who have both being very high, omalizumab and eosinophilia, and then you can use either. Since omalizumab is cheaper, you can try it first, like Dr. Nitin tried with his patient. But if you find it's not very useful, then you have to go on to use the anti-IL-5 uh, molecules. And very often this works well, like you the colors there, that is an overlap. Groups. These are not strict. But then you have this group of nice high eosinophils, uh, nor have high HE, and this is the TH2, uh, TH2 low asthma group. And what can you do in these patients if they're obese? You can try weight loss. Not very easy in this group because they can't exercise very much. They have very severe symptoms, very difficult to treat. You can try macrolides like azithromycin. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. Then in this group, it was advised that they use bronchial thermoplasty and it still finds a place in the uh, uh, GINA 2023 guideline. But again, you know, there are a lot of people who are asking, is it really useful? Who are the people who respond? I'm going to invite Amita, who is our interventional uh, bronchos bronchoscopist, head of IAB and so on, to talk to us a little about that. And in fact, another of our interventional pulmonologists, Dr. Vijay Kumar Chanamchati, wanted it taken off. But I thought we should bring it in to discuss why it's not useful, whether it will make a comeback or not. We need, need to wait and see. But let's take this last part of the discussion to that. I'll stop at this point, stop sharing, and invite, first of all, Amita to come in on bronchial thermoplasty and why it's got a bad name, and then invite the others to you know, come in on the how they choose their biologicals. Okay, and so then thank we you. Audience questions for the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Amita, go ahead, please. Yeah. So, Dr. Malit, first of all, very, very nicely you covered everything about biologics, when to choose what, what type of phenotypes, <coughs> any types. Very, very useful. So, basically, the thing is that, you know, when we are stuck with a person who's got TH2 low asthma, that is a time when biologics don't really help. And these are the people where, you know, often there is already remodeling of airway and there is just so much of smooth tissue the smooth muscles, which is completely obstructing the lumen. So however much bronchodilatation you do, how much of, how much of anti-inflammation you do, the smooth muscle, which is completely obstructing the airway, is not just going to become less. So this is the time you want to consider bronchial thermoplasty. And usually before doing bronchial thermoplasty, you want to just make sure that you give the macrolides, you know, and you want to just make sure all the boxes are ticked, the patients on, ICS, optimal doses in Lava and Lama and Montelukast, they are vaccinated, smoking cessation, weight loss, macrolides, all this is done. And then you think about bronchial thermoplasty. And I kind of feel that bronchial thermoplasty would definitely have some kind of a role, though it started with a big, huge hype. But I think that patients who have these huge airway remodeling over there, if the chunk of the airway is removed and we are going to basically make an airway for the air to pass through, then uh, I think it would be definitely useful. And the good thing about bronchial thermoplasty is that unlike biologic, it doesn't really reverse back. You know, so the thing is that there are studies for five years and they have shown that the patient continues to do well. But of course, it's very, very important to choose the right patient because I kind of feel that any kind of therapy gets a bad name when we start opening it for people who are not meant for it. So I kind of feel that if the patients are correctly chosen, then for a very, very few, definitely bronchial thermoplasty is still there to stay. I would say that. Absolutely. Completely agree with you. In fact, I was having this discussion with my IP colleague. I don't do interventional pulmonology, but this is one of those interventions that I feel still merits, you know, a closer look. And it's gone through this typical cycle. You know, initially there's a lot of skepticism. People say, what rubbish? And then it's adopted like it's the answer to every kind of asthma. It's the final common pathway. We finally burn up all the thing that is causing the spasm. And now it's fallen out of disfavor and be, people are rubbishing it. And I think it'll find its, you know, per per perfect patient in whom to use it. 
The problem is the company has withdrawn support for providing the catheters, catheters. and I think somebody else will pick up on it and it'll come back. You know, so that's that's my take on this now. As a non-IP person, uh, I'm, I'm going to invite Dr. Kumar to come in next on this because he, uh, Dr. Kumar, you do quite a lot of interventional pulmonology, don't you? Uh, sir, uh, we have uh, learned the process of thermoplasty, but not uh, done any cases. Uh, so I would just uh, like to add the point. Yes, uh, thermoplasty comes in the end and you know uh, it's an evolutionary process that happens with all the drugs that come in the market there is a huge fanfare uh, companies launch it they sponsor it and a lot of people some two three top guys gonna take it up and they're gonna advertise it and then you know uh, second tier people then take it and then slowly and slowly you know look pachau fight and then you know get to uh, uh get to the end and this pm uh, it normalizes the pm uh, prmt expression that ultimately leads to development of the smooth muscle cell so yes uh, you know bronchial thermoplasty will be used uh, more and more because uh, the results are good and uh, it will come down from tier 1 to tier 2 to tier 3 and yes a local developer will come up in certain years and will be using and I just don't think it will be restricted to asthma also. That asthma COPD overlap is also going to be included. And certain point of deviation from it is going to come for COPD also. Because the smooth muscle cell is a problem. The airway remodeling is not just a problem of asthma, but also in uh, ACOS and in COPD. So that bronchial thermoplasty or intervention, similar intervention like this, is going to come in the future and help us with patients which do not have any other answers. Absolutely. I would agree with you completely. So I'm going to stop at this point with our discussion, but I'm going to ask each of you to take up the uh, audience questions, uh, starting with Dr. Archana. Dr. Archana, we've had quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sukanti Bhattacharya from uh, West Bengal, Kolkata asks, what is the local, what is the role of glycopyrrolate in patients with severe asthma or uncontrolled asthma or difficult to treat asthma? Uh, in severe asthma, yes, Lama has a role in severe asthma according to the GINA 2023, but uh, tiotrapium has been used uh, in case of Lama, not glycopyrrolate. So we don't have much uh, uh, research on glycopyrrolate in case of asthma. Tiotropium, yes, Lama in uh, severe uh, asthma. And I think that answers Dr. Sampath from Vishakhapatnam. In response to your case, he says, in, in case one, instead of starting oral corticosteroids, I believe it would have been better to place tiotropium along with moderate dose ICS laba. And I'm sure you have an explanation for that. Dr. Archana, can you answer that? Why uh, you didn't go for tiotropium, but instead chose oral corticosteroids? Uh, I, I'll remind you that she was looking after the patient, knew how severe it is, how quickly she wanted to get things under control, but I let her answer the rest of it. Yes, you are absolutely right, sir. We, uh, the patient was uh, completely under control for so many years and the exacerbation was only from past uh, few uh, months, uh, nearly two months at all, that's all. So we uh, just wanted to give a short course of corticosteroids and we really wanted to know what is causing underlying problem causing the uh, exacerbation. That was the reason we didn't give uh, Lama in such case. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the most important things you said. It's, you it's always very important to find out why this person has got worse rather than throwing an additional molecule at him. Okay, so absolutely uh, right. I completely agree with you. I'm going to go to Dr. Nitin on this one. Dr. Nitin, you've used a lot of the biologic, so I think you're the best person to answer this. Oh, no. Dr. Bhavani Jayesh from uh, Maharashtra asks, biologics and asthma, advantages and side effects. If you could give us a quick I think very recap quick, of what very we quick discussed. Umele Zumeb, you have to be really worried about anaphylaxis in 7% of the patients. So it is better given in daycare. For all cost purposes, we also in inject Mepoli as well as Bendralizumab in our daycare, but there we don't admit the patient and observe him for a full day, whereas Umalizumab, we have to watch him for a full day, preferably. No? So he go goes up, goes back in the evening. Uh, a Bendrali patient can just come in, walk in, take it. Because of the cost involved, it is better that you know very experienced person delivers it. That's it. But not from the 
point of view of anaphylaxis so anaphylactic reactions are not expected i guess uh, reslizumab is the only one we give iv rest everything we give subcutaneous yes, right yes, everything is subcutaneous so no problem Absolutely. I, I, I wanted to add one more point in what uh, response to what uh, uh, dr arshina was talking about see uh, the bronchodilators will come more and more in play and therefore uh, anticholinergic also will come in play when the obstruction has become fixed so somebody who has gone on with an asthma for a good 20 years he starts behaving more like a copd and there adding that titopriam or whether it is a glycopyrinium or whether it for that matter even in the indicatorol even if you are using an additional bronchodilator it will add some value to the patient and you have to look at what is whether it is getting benefit and what are the side effects so that you balance that out so i think that is the answer to that question i wouldn't do it very early in the asthma where she was you know at that point in time there was no need to do titopriam that early and that is also when uh, asthma is uh, uh, progressing to copd in that case also if we are adding lama it should be in addition to inhaled corticosteroid right inhaled okay. corticosteroid has to be okay. there on okay. top of that we can go for always 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 no no so he was oh, adding on glycopyrinium uh, to the say to this you know or titopriam Can Sorry. I just say something? Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Go okay, ahead. Okay. So uh, I'll have a different take on this. Basically, studies have like clearly shown that uh, patients who have recurrent exacerbations, if you are going to add lama tiotropium, then the exacerbations mm-hmm. reduced, and also the trials have shown that in addition to lama ICS and lama was added, the time to the next severe exacerbation increased. You know, so cholinergics are also very very important in asthma. and in fact one of the advantages of bronchial thermoplasty is that cholinergic neural pathway is also ablated so basically i personally feel that uh, we should not really think about copd or fixed obstruction before we want to add a lama in a patient with difficult asthma because the thing is that in fact now we have triple inhaler therapy which anyways has lama lava and ics so i feel that we have to move away from this thought of anti mascarinics being anti cholinergic being for copd alone for asthma they are equally important because they prevent the risk of frequent exacerbations and even the time to first exacerbation no i i don't i don't think we are denying that but i think the point is that the case dr arshna presented had a sudden increase in inflammation and in that case you don't want to use uh, an anti cholinergic you want to use an anti inflammatory and that is important right, right. to bring it quickly under control and then you continue with something else and i think that's the point also that dr nitin was making that dr pradhan was making get the inflammation under control and if the patient is still not controlled you've tried everything else then certainly add on an anticholinergic no denying that at all but you're going to answer the next question again dr amita because this you you're the peak flow meter person dr sampath again asks isn't the peak flow meter going to miss small airway disease phenotype of asthma Yeah, wonderful. So basically, I would say that though Gina guidelines say that you know if you don't have access to spirometry, you may use peak flow meter to diagnose asthma. I mean, I think that even in India currently we have full access to spirometry. So the thing is that I don't, I would not really recommend a uh, peak flow meter now to diagnose asthma. I think peak flow meter is very, very good to basically make sure about the control of asthma. The thing is that the reversibility of asthma is still very, very important, and a peak flow meter tells about. So, Dr. Sampath is very, very right that a peak flow meter will miss small uh, airway disease. A peak flow meter can actually also miss asthma, but peak flow meter's main use is to make sure that the patient is doing well, and it's for assessing control of asthma. That's what the peak flow meter is something that I would really rate it for. And the two guidelines don't say. I feel if we want to talk about small airway disease, then I kind of feel IOS is something which is definitely the next step forward. And I just kind of feel that the guidelines need to really wake up and take note of this, because you know, in a patient whose spirometry is abnormal, if there's a large airway obstruction, spirometry will always show small airway obstruction. Whereas patients with small airway obstruction alone will be picked up by impulse oscillometry. And when Dr. Kumar also very nicely said that. sometimes patients are not ready to be started on uh, inhalers because they are saying our pft is fine but often pfts are abnormal you are suspecting as when ios picks up you know reversible obstruction so i think ios will be the best thing for small airway obstruction and dr sampath was correct in pointing out that peak flow meters often miss small airway but it is not for diagnosis of small airway 
but it's for control of asthma absolutely and we must always remember that when we do the lung function tests whether it's pyrometry or ios very often this is done during the day when the patient's asthma is at its best which is why dr pradhan pointed out that giving the patient a peaklometer looking for diurnal variation uh, drops in you know the peak flow when the patient is at work can often help to pick up asthma which is not going to be picked up when you just do a spirometry in the hospital so uh, good points dr amita in gina uh, also sir in gina also in the diagnostic algorithm they still place peak flow meter in the absolutely absolutely completely agree with you so uh, i think the next two questions are not really questions dr mandeep kaur sodi from uh, chandigarh uh, echoes what uh, uh, her fellow punjabi said young people do very well with dpi dr kirat said that mdi is mostly seen to be incorrectly used without the spacer so spacers do help a lot uh so there is a you know i think dr kerat you said both those things that younger people you're happy to use an mdi sorry a dpi and older patients mdi with spacer anything you want to add to that and the next question which again i think dr amarnath from uh, tirupati has said i think dr amita had already answered this breath activated versus mdi with spacer drug deposition comparison so dr kerat you can take both those So basically, what I had said is that I feel elderly are more comfortable with DPR using rota caps, nebulizers, rota halos, and with the young people, I felt <coughs> that DPR is better. What I actually meant to say is that breath actuated is I feel there's no coordination issue. The elderly are not able to have that sort of effort. They're not able to generate that effort, and the young people. even for them you know the coordination part even though it is better but uh, i i do rewrite more of the breath actuated inhaler so that's what i'm thinking. absolutely and the percentages i think dr amita has already mentioned with the breath actuated inhaler it can be around 27% this is what the initial studies from cepla had also shown and that's roughly the same between 20 and 27% that you get with the breath actuated remember that every dry powder inhaler is a breath actuated inhaler and with something like a turbo inhaler you get roughly the same percentages with an mdi with spacer you get various different you know uh, numbers quoted i've seen numbers going up to 40% with less than 2% of oropharyngeal deposition which is why i really like that combination if you can persuade a patient to use it and remember with a well controlled asthmatic they just have to take it morning and night so a lot of what i do is i ask the patient to take a mdi with a spacer morning and night and carry the breath actuated inhaler in their pocket for sos use if they are on smart therapy but every pulmonologist likes one or the other and i think there's honestly not much difference in clinical outcomes between any of these you should be familiar with the product your you know with the device that you're advising as dr amita said every time whether the patient is using it correctly you'll be surprised you know how often we teach them something and they do something completely <coughs> different and finally somebody who remembers it the first track of it the second time so it's got to be checked every time and it's got to be checked as she said every time by you i do it every single time with my patients and i demonstrate to i give them the link on the internet for them to use it because fortunately all the companies now have come out with the right way to use the inhaler and spacer and also to maintain the spacer because as dr kirat pointed out it soon gets coated with powder and stops working the valve stops working and that really spells that this is time to change your spacer the company say change it after 6 months but i think i am willing to push it to a year if they are maintaining it properly dr pradhan question to you what about uh, dr uh, Sorendranath Banerji from Nehmatpur says, "What about steroid reversibility usage now?" Uh, but I think he specifically wants Dr. Kirat to answer it. But we'll go to Dr. Pradhan first, and Dr. Kirat, you seem to have a fan there. So I didn't get the question. Uh, I didn't understand it either. But he says, "What about steroid reversibility?" Dr. Banerji, can you put put your question up more clearly so we can understand it? Are you talking I about think, steroid? Uh, can I? I think I've understood probably. 
So the thing is, you know, before when we wanted to check about reversibility, sometimes we do a PFT and after bronchodilator, the reversibility is poor. You know, so then you still want to see if the patients are going to be responsive to bronchodilators. Then you can either give them ICS for one full month and repeat PFT and look for FEV1 improvement of 200 ml plus 12 percent, or you can give them steroids, oral steroids, 0.6 mg per kg per day for two weeks, and then you repeat the PFT. And if the improvement of FEV1 is by more than 200 ml as well as 12 percent, then this becomes use of steroids in assessing reversibility. So this is what was even recommended before. I think that is what he's trying to say. I suspect so too. You know, that was what came to mind. I was thinking of the oral steroid reversibility. Uh, we hardly use it these days, but I think it is a legitimate way of using it. And I would much rather use the inhaled steroid rather than an oral steroid to assess reversibility. But well, we I don't like use it any longer. It is mentioned, the oral steroid reversibility in the old PFT books, it is mentioned. It has so, so I'm just uh, yeah. So I want to just add uh, it's it's both. It's basically 15 days of oral steroids or one month of ICS. They are actually the thing is that this is more for COPD because initially ICS was extremely controversial for COPD and therefore more for COPD treatment. It was said that if there was no reversibility on PFT, then you could try the steroid reversibility for COPD by either giving two weeks of oral steroids or four weeks of ICS and repeating PFT. But that is no longer advised very clearly to differentiate yes. between COPD and asthma. Yes, yes. absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. asthma also, sir, the GINA document particularly says that you should try to do the spirometry bef uh, before starting your ICS lab or something. Uh, and uh, because after giving them the treatment, you are unlikely to get that reversibility component in the spirometry. Yeah. So, so basically, they are trying to say that, that whether this patient is responsive to therapy or not, so that uh, if the patient is responsive to ICS lava, that means the patient is likely to be suffering from asthma. That's what probably they are trying to say. Yeah, so there are a couple of other questions. Let's get through what we can quickly. Uh, Dr. Amita, again, question specifically to you from Dr. Banerjee. What to do with a high IG, 1500 plus, controlled asthma and a normal HRCT? So here is a patient whose asthma is controlled, but the Ig is high and the HRCT is normal. What would you do, Dr. Amita? Yeah, so excellent question, Dr. Banerjee. What I would just want to say that I get IgE done only once in life for the patient. And regardless of the report, I just ignore the report and I keep on controlling him. If the patient is well controlled, you continue the same treatment. You actually repeat the PFT every three months. If the patient remains, the PFT is normal and there's no good bronchodilator reversibility. I will keep on, in fact, Reducing my medications for this patient. So IgE, I do only once in life to confirm what mediated pathway of allergy we are dealing with. Of course, if the patient is not doing well, if we are uh, thinking about uncontrolled asthma, or severe asthma, again, uh, I really would not go by IgE. I mean, I want to rule out ABPA, etc. I want to rule out other conditions. But just because IgE is high, if the patient's uh, asthma is well controlled, patient CT is not suggestive of ABPA, you don't want to think of ABPA. Because you know, I just want to say that we never treat reports. We treat patients. And we must always remember this, especially for us old timers. It's always treating the patients and never the gadget. So it's not so, only for old timers. Very, very important it's points. for everyone, yes, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Ashina, go ahead, please. So it's not only for old timers. It's for everyone. We should treat the patient, not the uh, reports. <laughs> That's very important. Yes, yes, I agree with you completely yes, on that. Yes, I'm yes. so glad Amita included herself with me as an old timer. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the important thing there is, yes, you ignore the IgE if everything is well controlled. But please confirm, as she said, with repeated lung function tests, make sure that that is not deteriorating. Don't go only by the symptoms of the patient to assess control. Very good points, Dr. Amita. There, there's another question. And I think... Uh, Dr. Banerjee again asks, uh, I, I think Dr. Nitin, can you take this? Is there any benefit from using inhaled steroids in frequent LRTI causing exacerbations? Uh, in fact, and I think we're discussing uh, asthma, we're not discussing COPD. So okay. let's eliminate that this from the a bit question. Of a trick right question because inhaled steroids per se are going to beget some infection. 
So all inhaled steroids, including serbutazonide, even cyclozonide, up to an extent is associated with some increase. Fluticosone fiorite is possibly seems to be having the least chance of giving you more respiratory infections, but the risk of pneumonia or risk of lower respiratory infection goes up with regular usage of inhaled steroids. Extremely rarely you will find that because you have an inflammation which is ongoing and person is colonized. So if you are co-treating, for example, I, I showed you a case where there was the tobromycin nebulized which was going on and then there was an inhaled steroid which was going on. So in the, that kind of an exceptional situation, you would be justified. But primarily, whenever you are thinking of using inhaled corticosteroid, think that yes, there is a likelihood of more chance of respiratory infections, particularly low respiratory infections. So I think keep that in mind. You don't have to be extremely scared of it. You can mostly manage most of those infections. But in chronic bronchial infections, coexistent with an airway hyperreactivity and a bad spasm, you may have to co-treat uh, with inhaled corticosteroids and nebulized antibiotics sometimes. May Absolutely. I ask everyone who is present here, how often would you advise a macrolide in a patient of asthma who does not have any evidence of the bronchic cases. How often would you do that? And no evidence of in active infection. So, you know, we so had amazing Amita, study. Dr. Amita, go ahead, please. Yeah. So basically, you know, the, we had amazing study, you know, and there are basically two aspects to, uh, I'm going to first answer Kirat's question. And then I'm going to add on to what Dr. Nitin said. I agree with him in response to Dr. Banerjee's question, but I want to add a few more points. So coming to Dr. Kirat's question, basically there are two aspects about azithromycin. So first is that very often we have mycoplasma and chlamydia infections of the throat, and these behave as triggers of asthma. So first of all, azithromycin helps in that. So azithromycin is very important. And the second part is that we had amazed the study in which especially people who have got TH2 low asthma, and they keep on getting frequent exacerbations, so over your biologic won't really help. You see, macrolides was found to be very useful, not only because they could be treating some mycoplasma chlamydia infection, but also over and above, they behave as anti-inflammatory medications and they reduce the risk of exacerbations. So basically, the thing is, whenever I'm dealing with a non-allergic asthma or when I'm uh, dealing with an asthma, which is uh, posigranulocytic or TH2 low asthma, and they are not coming under control, then I use as uh, I mean I use azithromycin so frequently, and often patients who have been sent to me on five milligrams of Visalone daily, I have started azithromycin for them, and I have been able to even get rid of that Visalone. So I feel that uh, you know uh, azithromycin therapy in difficult asthma should definitely after using ICS Lava, adding Lama, Montelukast, Theophyrin plus minus, etc. Patient is not getting better, can't afford biologics. Please consider using azithromycin. I would highly recommend it. Thank that you. was one. And uh, just adding on to what Dr. Nitin said. Sorry, uh, Dr. Murli, you want to add something? No, no, I said you wanted to add to what Nitin, yes. Dr. Nitin yeah, said. So I actually <laughs> want to just say that, you know, um, COPD is something in which ICS are associated with increased pneumonias. Uh, the studies have not found increased pneumonias in asthmatics with uh, ICS. So that is number one we need to remember that for uh, asthma, we should not really have a uh, huge uh, fear. And the second thing is that whenever it's a viral infection, so as Dr. Murli had rightly said, post-COVID, so after any viral, after any viral, there's an entity which is known as post-viral bronchial hyperreactivity. So after viral infection, often a patient have this dry hacking cough which goes on for weeks together. So basically the recommended treatment over here would be ICS lava if they don't respond to Montelukast. Similarly, atypical infections like chlamydia, mycoplasma, are actually known to be living in the throat and they keep on giving rise to wheezing after every LRTI. So I kind of feel that if it's, there's an atypical infection or viral infection, and if the patient has wheezing or if the patient has this dry, hacking, nocturnal cough, then I would be happy to use ICS lava for two weeks and patients actually get all right. It would be much better than giving oral steroids, so which a lot of people question? end up giving. Absolutely. Completely agree with you. I think that's... Uh, uh, and I'd completely agree on the azithromycin too, because I think it's far safer to use them than, you know, to continue to use oral steroids. And I would certainly try it in the low TH2 types, because that's a group where your biologicals are really not going to work. And I don't think we should push biologicals at them unless we have a definite target to treat. 
last two uh, questions what, and i'm going to uh, ask can, people can i ask sir hands. sorry uh, can i ask one yeah? question to M- yeah amita ma'am madam would you yeah. use the same dose of azithromycin in copd and asthma because we you we don't use uh, azithromycin that frequently in asthmatics but we use in uh, copd bronchiectasis so the dose is going to be the same in asthma as well Yeah, so the recommendation is either yeah, so two fifty daily for you can go up to one year. You give it for six months, either five hundred thrice a day. I mean thrice a week, five hundred milligrams of azithromycin either thrice a week or often patients take two fifty daily better. So you give it for six months, and if patients are better, then you continue it for one year. That is what is recommended, mm-hmm. and that is what we are doing. And please oh, check the hearing. Not- <laughs> Sorry. I said, please check the pure tone audiometry before you give it, and maybe and after QT. a few months. Yeah, and also if the elderly person do uh, yeah. ECGs on and off uh, for QT prolongation. Okay, last question. Anybody who wants to answer can put up their hands, please. Uh, uh, Doctor Saibal Ghosh asked this very interesting question: Can we use other form of more potent ICS in place of budesonide before label labeling as uncontrolled asthma? Yeah, so, I think. But, uh, Can I can I Nitin want to answer go ahead Nitin uh, uh, now I, I want to counter Amita's claim on this that asthma there is no increased risk of pneumonia there is enough data documentation that even in asthma regular usage of inhaled corticosteroid does increase risk of asthma I have a BMC article right now with me so Amita that you are wrong on that it is not only COPD it is even in asthma there is an increased risk of pneumonia so I think that that issue is definitely undoubted uh, the, but can you go on to more potent steroids I think we have a chance of using fluticasone furate now because the fluticasone furate per se is a more potent effect more effective drug and at a lower dose so i think you know there is there is an opportunity to explore this particularly when you are a conventional therapy with say budesonide formotrol in standard 800 microgram dose is failing i tend to go to a combination of 100 plus 25 that is 200 plus 25 micrograms of uh, fluticasone furate with uh, valenterol and that seems to be doing the trick again mm. because um, the, it has better efficacy better bronchodilatation mm. and uh, because of the overall dose getting reduced the risk of pneumonia also goes down so that's a very good uh, point uh, you uh, made uh, 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 throwing caution in the wind uh, nitin sir uh, i would just like to add one point that you know this valenatrol fluticasone uh, combination is very good for stable patient but for initiating the treatment you still no, no, no not for initiating this is for people who are say failing your conventional therapy you can go to them Uh, I have in my or stabilizing if they are stabilizing you go on to a lower speed. dose if they are not sorry, stabilizing can, can, you go on to a higher I am going to call a call, call to this Dr Nitin <laughs> let him complete his sentence and then you can respond Dr Kumar sir please go ahead yeah, complete your sentence uh, how so small my experience be I have seen that uh, you know valnetrol fluticasone combination is good for the stable uh, stable asthma patients and uh, but you know initiating the treatment with the uh, ultra laba uh, ultra laba uh, this combination ics combination i have uh, not found the results to be suitable personal experience i don't put it on everybody else this is my my take on it Uh, there Nitin, is within your response please because yeah. once a day therapy typically in indian patients i have found it to be kind of un, uh, you know uh, not able to take it take it uh, to the hilt in uh, in uh, patients who are come with uh, come with, uh, come to us in exacerbation mode or coming to us for the first time so in a stable a stable asthma patient yes i'll go for that combination that is my take i don't put it on everybody else to follow it great quick response dr nitin because we're reaching 10 o'clock yeah, we've yeah, even yeah. reached uh, dr krishna's very, very, very one se- one sentence the response from my side yeah if, if the patient is elderly having comorbidities i would consider this combination once in a day with a lowest possible dose as a first stop rather than giving them formotrol budesonide or equivalent and younger patients absolutely yes i will still start with bid and then if they are failing then again reconsider uh, valenterol fluticasone so it is not a first choice either ways right and uh, again it's useful to those... can i please add can i add something please sure sure please yeah so i basically want to just say that uh, i still prefer bd dosage uh, laba ics if i have to start my patient 
and uh, if my patient is doing very very well and uh, if i want to reduce medication then i might go to od dose or a patient who is very very non compliant and do i write bd if they end up taking od only then i may go to uh, an ultra lava combination that was one thing and the second thing is that though normally i never like to argue with nitin i want to uh, argue with nitin about his pneumonia point nitin i categorically said that the question of pneumonia is more so with copd and ics and the fear of pneumonia and inhaled ics for asthma is not really there because it's a copd people who are the ones who die and therefore ics is never a problem in patients of asthma because if you don't use ics at the right time you have to give them oral steroids which will improve your immunity even more so i want to basically say that if so i i'm, I'm going to play the judge here LR, dr yeah. amita dr Sorry? amita i'm going to play the judge here being the moderator uh, yes. i'm going to ask dr nitin to send his the article that he was looking at to you but yes, yes i agree that, that what i have read is that there is no increased risk in asthma of pneumonia as compared to copd but nitin could you please send both those reports you know that Uh, paper to both of us and yeah. we'll we'll no, discuss and, it and, in no, private we're running out of time i'm seeing one other, uh, other thing that increased risk of pneumonia the question is with copd where the role of ics is not very very confirmed where is the role of ics in asthma is very very controlled i mean like basically ics is the main line of treatment so the thing is that no, no. if so the patient I, I, has asthma I, I, has no, no, let's not confuse things here no let's not confuse things here i think nitin said high doses because that was the question no, no, no. in somebody who used higher doses no 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 one minute the question asked by dr banerjee was that if the patient of asthma has lrti would you be uh, sorry if a patient has lrti asthma has lrti would you give steroids or some uh, would you give ics no, no. so he, the no, question let is let me read there. the question the question is any benefit from using inhaled steroids and frequent lrti is causing exacerbation so i i think we we'll leave it at that because we are running out of time it's lovely to have no, these so dr banerjee has actually added and he's rectified the that like he's in fact helped us out thank you dr banerjee he's written that uh, 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 if the this containing mixture of bacterial isolate any role on recurrent lrti and asthma that is a Means, different question ma'am <coughs> yes yeah, so, so let's not take it because as a trade yeah. name it contained a mixture of bacterial isolates and this was injectable steroid so i don't think we are going there now but uh, we have officially touched 10 pm now <laughs> sorry we have officially touched 10, 10 exactly i think it's time to stop uh, thank you for reminding me and any further controversies we'll take up later i traditionally end by asking each of you to give one line but i don't think i we even have time for that we've had a great discussion uh, lovely contributions from all our panelists uh, i thank you know cci dr krishna in particular for giving us this opportunity unfortunately he doesn't seem to have come on i believe dr kirit we had over 900 and what 17 logins or something like that dr kirit i leave the last word with you as the official representative the spokesperson for cci thank all our panelists also for a great discussion dr archana dr pradhan dr kumar utsav dr nitin abhyankar dr amita nene and hand back to dr kirat to wrap up the proceedings thank you everyone for joining us and i want to personally thank everyone for joining in and i and when i say that i mean the panelists because uh, i i feel like i'm meeting you only this is the feeling i get when i see everyone at a webinar i feel like i'm actually sitting and talking to dr mita it's so nice to see ma'am and i'm it's like i get to see dr murli see dr nitin see dr kumar sir meet new people wonderful people like dr arjuna dr pradhan and i look forward to meeting you all in person so thank you for joining us today and i'm sure i really enjoyed this webinar i hope that audience also did and i'm sure the panelists also would have enjoyed it So thank you very much for such an enlightening and interesting discussion. Thank you everyone and good night. Thank I would like you to just add good um, night. you know one minute one minute Dr. Murli sorry a huge big thank you to Dr. Murli because I think you have done such a fantastic job Dr. Murli you just kept us all together and you kept the conversation so interesting and the best thing is that you always wound up you know the discussion point and you make sure there was no doubt in anybody's mind 
so thank you for uh, this excellent moderation thank you for involving each of us equally well a huge thank you to my every panelist who was so amazing here and a big thank you to dr krishna and cci thank perfect. you everybody thank dr murli perfect empire perfect referee Perfect. Thank you all so much. I've enjoyed myself here. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Good night. Thank thank you. you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Good night. Thank you sir. And thank you so you have been an excellent, excellent moderator. One of one of the best I've ever been. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you all. Thank you.